Hello, and welcome to Communicore Weekly. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. You spin me right round, baby, right round. Like a record, baby. Round. Round, round, round. <laughs> it's time for Disney History! The King Arthur Carousel that's uh, in this or near the center of Disneyland is also pretty central to the park's uh, history in general. Walt Disney always said that some of his ideas for this new kind of theme park came while he was waiting near Griffin Park merry-go-round that his daughters were riding. Uh, and coincidentally, in 2010, the Opera House at Disneyland uh, had a display of that actual bench that he had been sitting on at the time when he came up for the idea for Disneyland. Yeah, when it came time to build, you know, his own park, gee, I'd like to have my own park someday. Yeah, right? He, yeah, no kidding. He placed the carousel in a most telling place, so to speak. Not only is it in the middle of the courtyard, but it's in a place where anybody can see it from hundreds of feet away. Guests on Main Street can look across the hub and see the glittering lights of the carousel through the castle's archway. It, it, it's, it's another weenie. It's an alluring sight that draws you further into Disneyland's fairy tale fantasy. So, it, the King Arthur Carousel refers to the same legend that was the basis for the movie The Sword and the Stone, but the imagery for the carousel isn't from that movie, it's from Sleeping Beauty. And that's, it's represented by nine hand-painted scenes that uh, circle the carousel's core, which is, is pretty cool. Uh, the, the attraction also uses the old sparing variation of carousel with two R's, uh, mm -hmm. but the meaning is still the same, which is, you know, a whirling ride with moving <laughs> horses, which... You know, I like carousels. Carousels are cool. They they differ kind of from merry-go-rounds because uh, they merry-go-rounds have animals and benches, but some of them don't move up and down. But carousels are just horses. And ironically, you know, Disneyland's carousel was originally a merry-go-round. Uh, it was built in let me look in 1875, and it was in Toronto, Canada. When, act when Disney actually bought it. He brought it back to the new park. The Disneyland designers took off all the other animals and seats and added over two dozen horses that they purchased from other carousels. Uh, so it sort of was like Pimp My Carousel, I guess. You totally Pimp My Carousel. Yeah, cool. Well, they even got one from Coney Island. So, well, anyway, uh, during the renovation, some of the removed seats were added to the cars of the Casey Jr. Circus train. So, hey. Reuse, reduce, and re. Well, anyway, uh, Disneyland's carousel. <laughs> nice, nice green initiative, I, tell I was you, try, there. you know, I was trying. Uh, the, the carousel opened with 68 hand carved, hand painted antique wooden horses laid out in 17 rows of four. And all the horses seemed to be leaping, which is an effect that the Disney designers created when they attached new legs to some of the horses that previously had all four on the floor. Now, the horses, they were all now a really gleaming white color thanks to this new paint that was applied in the 1960s over, over the previous shades that they were, which were black and tan and cream and brown. They just really wanted to make them stand out more. Uh, they also added brightly colored saddles and jewels and other details to help distinguish each horse. They didn't want them all to be the same. They were all different. So for its first three decades of existence, the gar carousel's uh, music came from the, uh, is it, Cal Calliope? How do you, is that who said Calliope. That? Calliope. Thank you for doing that because I never would have got it correctly. <laughs> the Calliope, and it also only costs an A ticket from uh, Disney's ticket book. So it's it like that's actually an A ticket. It's an A ticket. Oh, it's an A ticket. A -A -A ticket. Yes, so, case, so Calliope and an A ticket. <laughs> an A ticket. <laughs> so and it was an A ticket for a two minute ride <laughs> at four miles per hour. That's that's pretty fast, guys. That's, that's probably the fastest ride at Disneyland, and you can quote me on that. Yes, uh, please do. <laughs> Anyways, in the early 80s, the King Arthur Carousel was remodeled along with the rest of Fantasyland. They actually moved it. They moved it by about 20 yards, I think, to open up the congested area right near the castle. And also put it closer to Mr. Toad's Wild Ride and moved the twirling teacups closer to Alice in Wonderland. The music was transformed when the Disney classics playing next door at Dumbo the Flying Elephant became the soundtrack for the carousel as well. You know, it's been around for over 50 years now, and the one thing that hasn't changed is that guests still love it. Especially uh, Julie Andrews, whose initials and uh, her Mary Poppins silhouette, they are on one of the saddles of one of the horses. I, I, its name is Jingles. Mm -hmm. I forget which one it is exactly, but I know it's there. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, but, and if people want to pay us to come out there with them, we will show them. Yeah, we'll this. personally show you that horse after we look mm -hmm. for it ourselves. Exactly. You know, they... they 
take really good care of this carousel cell, cell too. You know, they polish it for six hours every night, all the brass poles, um, and they do frequent touch-ups on the horses. And, you know, it still warms hearts with its traditional pleasures, you know, style and timeless beauty, making it the perfect centerpiece to Fantasyland. He's a nerd, he's a geek, he's a geek, but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. It's George's Book of the Week. For this week's Book of the Week, I wanted to look at Walt Disney's railroad story, The Small Scale Fascination That Led to a Full Scale Kingdom by Michael Brockie. Now, less than a month before Disneyland's opening day in 1955, Walt journeyed to the under construction theme park for the first live steam up of locomotive number two. This was the culmination of a lifelong dream for Walt, and this is a direct quote from the book. He climbed into the cab, moved the Johnson bar forward, tugged twice on the steam whistle, and pulled open the throttle. With Harley again in the fireman's seat and the book's author as a wide-eyed 12-year-old sitting on the tender, Walt eased number two from the roundhouse into the bright Californian sun and onto the main line. Now, imagine that moment in Walt's life. After years of making films and building the company, he finally finds himself as the chief engineer of a real engine. His engine. Walt Disney's life had been surrounded by trains. Family members worked on the railroads. Uh, both Roy and Walt were news butchers during their teens. Uh, of course, a lot of the animators at Disney were rail fans. Ward Kimball traveled with Ward to the 48 Railroad Fair and was the first person to have his own backyard full-size railroad. Uh, Ollie Johnson had a backyard railroad, and many of the studio employees shared Walt's love of miniature railroading and full-scale steam. And, you know, really for the first half of the 20th century, railroads were the future of the country. They symbolized progress and growth, so it makes sense that he'd want one in his park. Well, the author, Roger, Bro uh, Roger Brogy, is considered to be Walt's first Imagineer, and he's the author's father. He's a very talented machinist, and Roger supervised the building of the Lily Bell, Walt's 1-8 scale engine that ran at his Homeby Hills estate. He also helped create the first audio, audio animatronic character. So Roger's son, Roger Jr. and Michael, the author, spent many years actually working at the studio with their father and helping Walt on the Disneyland Railroad. I mean, really, Jeff, talk about being in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I need, I need to like have someone in my family that yeah, worked work on there. Jeez. Well, anyways, so looking at Michael's close association with the Disney family, the company, and Walt's Railroad, he really is uniquely qualified to write a biography about Walt Disney that focuses on how railroading affected his life and drove many of his passions. Walt Disney's railroad story is an, it's a fantastic journey from Walt's boyhood all the way up through the theme parks. We encounter every single moment of his life in reference to trains, and we really we come to understand his passion for the steel. This is also a treat to read about Walt from a company insider whose family worked and still works for Disney. The book is presented in chronological format with tons of pictures. There's pictures on every page. Uh, Michael adds sidetracks that need to go into further detail. Uh, like sidetracks? Yeah, sidetracks? No, sidetrack, uh. yeah. Sidetrack we're reading. It was pretty good. Like a spur line. Whether it's on a railroading term or a person. Uh, there's a lot of focus on the Carrollwood Pacific line that they built the Holmby Hills property, which is great because it's one of the first places I actually saw a layout of the, the Holmby Hills property. And a majority of Walt's ideas about Disneyland were formulated while conducting the Lily Bell around the property. He also covers every train ever built for a Disney theme park up to the Animal Kingdom. There's a glossary of rail terms, detailed specifications of the Disney engines, and a bibliography. This really goes to show that Broggy has indeed created an amazing and fact-filled tome about Walt Disney and railroads. Uh, the book is is one of my favorites. Along with the Nickel Tour and Since the World Began, it, it's really one of the treasures of my collection because, sadly, it is out of print right now, and it's pretty expensive. If you have any interest in Walt's personal life, railroads, or Disney engines that chug the tracks all over the globe, then you need to get a copy of this book. News Flash! We can't wait to tell! So before we jump uh, into this week's Disney debate, we just want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the other events going on during Epcot's 30th anniversary weekend. Um, now, as some of you already know, our live show, which is where, George? In the Norway Pavilion. That's right. It, it's <laughs> sold out, and we have a pretty long waiting list for people who want to get in. But 
Unfortunately, not everyone can get in. So, there are a bunch of other events going on that weekend that Mice Chat is sponsoring and that we'll be at that are free that you guys should totally come to. Exactly. The, the first one uh, is actually happening the afternoon of the live show. And it's going to be, obviously, Saturday, September 29th. Starts at 3.30 at Epcot, and it's being called the Epcot 30th Anniversary Mice Quest. And it's free. You just have to register online. You can go to micechat.com slash store, click on the Mice Quest logo, and you can register a team of one to four people. Um, Mice Chat's Kevin Yee is, has designed the scavenger hunt, and apparently it's going to be fun-filled. So um, I'm not so sure. But that's okay. He says it should be good for the whole family and will take place on the Mexico side of World Showcase from 3.30 until 6.30. Now, spoiler alert, if any of you come and you're dressed in Communicro Weekly swag, whether it's, you know, official or homegrown, we will help you cheat. We will help you cheat. We will help you win. And that's all we'll say about that. That's what's going to happen. We, we won't guarantee you'll win, but we'll do our darndest. We will do our darndest because we, we will, will have answers. Darndest. We'll have answers and we'll just yes. help you win because you support us. So we will support you in turn. Yes. So if they're wearing like a Communicore Weekly t-shirt or if they've made their own t-shirt or they write Communicore Weekly on their forehead. Uh, you know what? I'll even say if they come up to us and be like, hey, we really like this show. I'll be like, cool. Here's an answer to question number five. Yep. Or I an, think we yeah, should. Here's the, here's the answer. Should. Yeah. Well, after after we finish helping everybody cheat, of course, there's another event that Mice Chat has set up on Sunday, which is called a sip and nibble around the world. So basically, that is, you know, we're all a group of us are going to get together and sip and nibble about all all the stuff at the food and wine event, mm -hmm. and it is free, but you can also sign up, and I think if you pay, I think it's like three ninety nine. It's three ninety nine. You can mm -hmm. get a lanyard and like a name tag and a commemorative uh, sip and nibble um, glass to sip wine out. Like of. A sh yes, yes, that you can share with. I think. But I mean, but you what... don't need to pay for that though. If you don't want, to. Oh. if you don't want that, it's you, you know, you can just come and hang out and be for free. Hang out and see all the cool people. Yeah, it actually, it's you will be given a lanyard with a marker attached so you can record your progress as you tour the world of food and drink, and a small glass to conveniently share sips during the journey, exactly. which sounds absolutely spectacular. And also, if you come wearing a Communicore Weekly shirt, either official or unofficial, I'll let you buy me a drink. That's fantastic. That is a great idea. That's a good idea. And of deal. course, I'll have my cup and I'll share it with you. Sounds good. Sounds good. So make sure to check out micechat.com slash store because both of the uh, events have registrations not for the cheating part don't tell them we're going to help you cheat we don't want them to know but just go to micechat.com slash store look for the sip and nibble around the world and the free mice chat scavenger hunt yes it is no it isn't it's a debate who's gonna So, you know, Jeff, we always get into these Disney debates and we sometimes agree. And I think this might be one. Um, uh, had a fan say that we should look at Big Thunder Mountain Railroad and whether it was better to ride it at day or night. And we both kind of text each other at the same time. I call night. So I <laughs> guess we should probably hmm. talk about this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do, you want, do you want me to take day just so it would be more no, of a, no, of a no, debate? No, 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 not at all. You know, it's it's Big Thunder Mountain. Most people ride it during the day just because that's when the park's open with the most hours. But I had the opportunity to ride Big Thunder Mountain Railroad for the first time at night at Disneyland while Fantasmic was playing. So it was like triple special. That's like a whole bunch of sensory overload, I yeah, think. Yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. It was great. And, and you know, of course, the, the basics for riding uh, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad at night is uh, it, it's harder to see where you're going. The sensory, it's, uh, there's a lot more going on. And it's just more awesome. It's usually cooler, too, so you get that nice breeze. Yeah, and I, I agree. And, you know, I think overall, every ride is better at night. Oh, I mean, rides that are outside are better at night, and especially when it comes to roller coasters. I'm a, I'm a big fan of roller coasters in general at night, and Big Thunder Mountain, no matter which park it's in, is no exception whatsoever. I, I just think the, the lighting on the ride makes it look a lot cooler. Um, like you said, you know, it, it's not as hot at night, so you get a nice cool breeze as you're rushing around, and Th well, there's hardly any, any line at night and, sometimes. Yeah, and when you said the uh, the lights, you know, you can see some special effects that you can't see anywhere else. Like there's a party scene going on 
and the little town of Dry Gulch there. Yes. And only at night can you see the people dancing through the window. The windows at the top, which is fantastic. Yeah, it's almost like a, a five-legged goat in a way. Its own little five-legged ooh, ooh. goat there. Ooh. And that's right. Big Thunder Mountain does have a goat or two, doesn't it? Yes. A little little trick for some of you folks that works both at day and night, by the way. Uh-huh. Um, there's the part where you come over the one little cresting hill you know, towards the end, and you can see a goat standing on top of a little mountain. If you look at that goat, as opposed to looking ahead of you and following your eyes as you go down. Stare at that goat while you go down the hill, and it just makes your body feel extra weird and cool. And it's a nice little added effect that you can do to yourself, I guess. I don't know. It's cool, I think. And I guess with your riding partner, if you hold their head and make them look at it, then you've done that to somebody else. Yes. So yes. just yourself. Okay. Well, well uh, great. That's Is that like the first real good tip we've ever given anybody on the show? I, I think that's probably the only tip we have ever given, and it, thank God it was a good one. Well, I hope so. I haven't tried it yet. Well, we'll have to figure it out. I mean, it's hard to explain that feeling of what it actually feels like, but, but you'll see when we go. I'll make you look at the goat, and then that's it. But I can't wait. So nighttime? That's Nighttime is I the right time? I think we're going with night, nighttime is the right time for the Big Thunder Mountain. Well, yes, I think that's... Well, any time is a good time to ride Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. Yes. But the nighttime works out. So, Disney talk again, not Disney debate. Exactly. But we want everybody listening and watching to tell us what they think as yeah. well. Yeah, let us know what you think about it. And if you disagree with us, I mean, you're wrong, but, but tell we, us we value your opinion. Yes, we do. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. So this Luke's five-legged goat is less goat and more gopher, if you will. On a Splash Mountain, there's a bunch of gophers that pop out of the holes in the ground just before the really big lift hill, but before the big drop. And the last gopher that drops down from the ceiling, actually, he yells F-S-U. Now, these are the initials of Florida State University, which one of the Imagineers working on that section of the ride graduated from and wanted to show his uh, little support for his alma mater. Well, thanks so much for watching another episode. Yeah, please leave us a comment either here on YouTube or if you're watching uh, or if you're listening, you know, rate us on iTunes because every little bit helps. So please let us know what you think about the shows. Yep. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, something about Jeff's pronunciation, feel free to email us at communicorweekly at gmail.com. Uh, my pronunciation is usually pretty good, especially, you know, with the French stuff, but uh, uh, clearly not this week. But... Uh, <laughs> You know, if you don't want to email us, if you want to get to us on other social media, like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communicorweekly. We post there all week long, photos, other stuff, cool stuff we find, so like us on over there. Yep, and don't forget, sometimes we do uh, contests like the uh, fan of the week, or we give away things as well, like lockets of our hair. Yes, yes. Oh, I should have ruined that. That's an upcoming contest. <laughs> Well, anyways, if, if, if you're done stalking us on Facebook, try following us on Twitter, because we always have the funny stuff going on Twitter. You can follow me. I'm at Imaginerding, and he's at Jeff Heimbuck. And if you need to figure out how to spell that, just look on YouTube. And uh, I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And both of us, we are from Mice Chat. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly. Captain EO, 